welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn, and today I'm talking to Hannah Gibson about Swahili, Bantu languages, and nouns. Hannah, welcome to Lingthusiasm. We're very happy to have another fellow enthusiastic linguist on the show today. I was wondering if you could introduce yourself and what your current role is. Yeah, my name is Hannah Gibson um, and I'm currently a lecturer at the University of Essex in the UK. Excellent. How did you get into linguistics? Ah, reluctantly perhaps. (laughs) Um, so I've always loved languages, um, loved learning languages. I had friends who spoke different languages at school and loved learning, you know, the odd word here or there or phrases and, and things. Um, and at school, I learned a bit of German and mm-hmm. a bit of Spanish. And then I went to university. Um, yep. I went to SOAS, so School of Oriental African Studies uh, in London. Yep. And I got there and I was supposed to be studying law. Okay. And I, <laughs> I got there and I found out that you could study, I think the list was like 43 different languages from around the world. Yeah. Um, and I was amazed and I thought, I can't be here and not study one of these <laughs> languages. Um, so I changed my my studies a little bit to study Swahili in law. So I had this list of languages and thought, oh, which languages do I want to study? Um, and so I studied Swahili in law, um, really thinking, oh, I'm interested in languages, learning languages, but I'm not interested in linguistics because I didn't really know perhaps what linguistics was. It is one of the biggest problems is that people don't actually know what linguistics is. I thought, oh, I like learning languages and I like talking to people, but mm, this linguistics thing, you know, not so sure about that. Um, Anyway, the more I studied Swahili in that case and the more I learned about languages, I did an introduction to kind of linguistics course and I thought, okay, this is absolutely fantastic. And then I moved to linguistics and I've never looked back. We're very happy to have you. Um, I'm not going to ask you any questions about law. (laughs) Thank you. Um, (laughs) But uh, for those who aren't familiar with uh, the Swahili language, can you tell us a bit about where it's generally spoken and other fun fun Swahili facts? Absolutely, absolutely. So Swahili is a language spoken across East Africa. So the kind of homeland or traditional kind of area where Swahili was spoken and was along the coast of present-day Tanzania and Kenya, mm-hmm. um, and also onto some of the islands, so you might have heard of places like Zanzibar, so that's again on the off the Tanzanian coast. But Swahili is also now, and has been for a long time, used as a lingua franca throughout East Africa, so okay. you find it spoken in like Uganda, Democratic Republic of Congo, parts of northern Mozambique and southern Somalia, Rwanda and Burundi, so it's got a huge sort of geographic coverage, but that East Africa kind of area. Cool, we'll make sure we link at least to the Wikipedia article and a good map. Absolutely, kind of yeah. The domain of it. Yeah. And across the the global diaspora as well, but that's its sort of, yeah, that's its heart. Awesome. And, yeah. So you studied that all the way through your undergraduate Yes, career. and I spent a year in East Africa, so studying at a university in, in Zanzibar in that case, in Tanzania. So one semester in Kenya and one semester in Tanzania, just focusing on Swahili. So that was where I really sort of, my eyes were open to um, language and linguistics and just thought, yeah, I want to do this for as long as I possibly can. So, yeah. Awesome. And I just then took more and more linguistics courses after that. So. so you took more linguistics after that, and then you ended up Doing going into a master's? master's in linguistics at SAWAS as well. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. And then a PhD? In linguistics, also at SAWAS. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're onto a good thing. Absolutely. And I think, yeah, for me, so I'm interested in languages from East Africa, African languages. Um, SAWAS was a great place to, to do that. Expertise was all around me. Um, and I think because I'd studied law as an undergraduate, <laughs> it actually felt like quite a change because I yeah. was, it was completely different teachers. It was a different department. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, I'm still here. I, by the time I got to a PhD, it was a little bit like, <laughs> <laughs> like that. But yes, um, it, was, it was a great place to, to do well, that. So I don't think it's as common in North America, but I did my undergrad and postgraduate studies at the same university. There you go. Um, there you go. And if you want to study Swahili and law, actually, so that's the only place I know in the UK that you can do it. So yeah, yeah that's beyond not, that, there's not, like, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> not a lot of places. No. Um, so there's obviously a bit of a transition there from learning about, you obviously got into mm. linguistics because you're interested in Swahili. Yeah. What was the difference between learning Swahili mm. as a language learner and studying, like, is your work focused on Swahili or do you look at 
other languages? Oh yeah, it's a really it's a really good question. I suppose it was quite a transition. So the last few years, most of my work. So my PhD was on a different language, not on Swahili. It was on a language called Rangi, okay, um, or Langi, spoken in Tanzania. And I can we can talk more about that. <laughs> um, but that was when I first sort of yeah came with more of the kind of linguistic approach because rather than although I did learn a bit of the language, I was thinking of it yeah. as a you know well, how do I learn about this and you know, do research and things. Um, I think it's about perhaps building sort of like almost shortcuts. So if you're learning a language, you're just thinking of it perhaps in isolation and what are these words and how do I make a sentence? Yeah. And then with linguistics, you're sort of looking for shortcuts and common patterns because you're like oh well I know what you know grammatical gender is like oh I can now you know work that across whatever language you put in front of me so it's making those connections some of which are language specific and that's really interesting um but I'm also interested in then obviously as linguists we're interested in what is common across languages what you can do what you can't do so maybe bigger questions I always think of it as the difference between learning to play football and learning to be a good football coach the difference between you being able to kick the ball really well. And, like, I'm a terrible mm. sports player. Yeah. So <laughs> I feel like this analogy works for me because, like... You, you know, don't know what it involves. As a, works as an analogy for me because I'm very unrealistic about it. Um, but you can invest a lot of effort in learning yourself how to play the game really well, but you can only ever really learn a couple of codes of football, right? But mm. if you learn how to read a group of people and how they move and what the rules are there's more chance that you could potentially kind of become really observant about how rugby works. And again, this is a terrible analogy because I'm not interested in rugby <laughs> or football, but... Um, I feel like you thought this analogy through. I thought this, this, this is my go-to analogy. Um, so moving from being a kind of player of Swahili mm-hmm. to figuring out the rules of the Bantu language family. So Swahili is part of the Bantu family? Yeah, exactly. So the Bantu languages are a group of something like... 350 to 600 languages, depending on okay. how you define a language so and where you draw a boundaries. Pretty good size family of yeah. languages. Yeah. So about the size yeah. of Indo-European, I guess, which is the family English is in. It's yeah. about four or five hundred. There you go. So it's it's a massive yeah language family. Um, so that sort of yeah group of languages that are spoken. I generally just say in sub-Saharan Africa, but sort of basically from Cameroon eastwards and southwards with pockets of other languages yeah. that aren't Bantu languages in those regions as well, but lots of sub-Saharan Africa Just find to languages. zoom out a little bit for people who aren't familiar with the incredible linguistic mm. diversity of Africa, because I think, you know, in Australia we kind of have between 150 and 300 languages, depending on how you count, but they're all kind of either part of one big Pamanuian mm. family or mm-hmm. not. And so we kind of, we don't often, and, you know, all of Europe is pretty much Indo-European except for a few languages. It's hard to kind of comprehend just how much diversity there is in the African continent. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think um, estimates put the number of languages in Africa somewhere around 2,000. Okay. Um, so I don't know what your numbers for the number of languages in the world are, but I think... <laughs> what do you say? So some people I've heard 7,000. Yeah. So if you take 2,000 of those being in Africa, <laughs> that's a massive proportion. It's... T- not quite, not quite a quarter, but it's a lot. No. Um, and then, so say you have something like 2,000 or more languages in Africa, those are then broken down into four language families, broadly. Okay. So that's been the tradition anyway. So you have four sort of language families, and then the Bantu languages are part of one of those language families, so Niger-Congo group. But yeah, even if you put the sort of higher end of the numbers of Bantu languages at 600, as you can see, like of those 2,000, you've still got lots of other languages. Um, yeah. So, yeah, really high levels of linguistic diversity, quite high levels of bilingualism and multilingualism across African continent as well. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, in Tanzania, where I do much of my research, that's like one country and it has 120 languages, like recognised, you know, identified languages. So, yeah, it's like a lot of linguistic diversity. Um, and Rangi is also part of the Bantu language Absolutely. family. Absolutely, yeah. So Rangi is a yeah, Bantu language spoken in central Tanzania. Um, and I started working on Rangi because I'm interested in, amongst other things, language contact. Right. So Rangi is a Bantu language. It's spoken in this area of central Tanzania. So basically the bottom of the Rift Valley, if people have oh, <laughs> some kind of idea of sounds, the Rift Valley. yeah. That sounds very... Dr- what, what is the Rift Valley? Oh, Gosh, so it is. <laughs> it is a, a valley that goes from, I suppose, that part of yeah, um, Tanzania 
uh, northwards. That's how I, I think of it. And it, it's like physically a, a rift, so I suppose to do with tectonic plates and things, okay. but I'm definitely out of my depth if it's I'm okay. talking we're, about we're those kind of things. We're not a podcast <laughs> enthusiastic about geology. There you go. Fine. There you go. <laughs> Um, but so Rangi is interesting because, uh, for lots of reasons, but it is completely surrounded by speakers of non-Bantu languages. Okay. So I was interested in whether some of the grammar of Rangi, the features that you find in Rangi, would be the result of contact with non-Bantu languages. Right. So we can talk more about that, but one of the things is whether languages that are similar to each other yep. have different influences when they're in contact than languages that are very different. So right. in the case of Rangi, it's like... I don't know, you know, Spanish being in contact with Japanese or something. Like, it's really, really unrelated, uh-huh. you know, completely different language yeah. families in, like, one geographic area and what happens then. One thing I'm really interested in with language contact is sometimes it makes languages move more similar because they're all hanging out. And it's like, well, I do this in this language and it's handy, so I'm going to do it in the other language too. And then sometimes they kind of pull apart because it's like, well, I want to be different. So Absolutely. So, I mean, one of the nice things about working on, just to step back, working on the Bantu languages is you have a large language family with some really quite big, broad similarities, so kind of typological similarities, so common things in lots of them, but then really small micro variations. So you can sort of say like, oh, this is the general word order, but like, look at this tiny change between the languages. Um, and These guys over here have to be different. They do. Yeah. They do it different. And so one of the things that's interesting about the area of Central Tanzania where I work is you have the four language families that I mentioned at the beginning, so that are found in Africa. Tanzania is the only place where you find all four. So right. it's almost like the meeting point of those really different languages. Yeah. And so the question there is, if you're a Rangi speaker and you're surrounded by different types of languages, whether the language has changed to reflect that. And then the sociolinguistic stuff. So when you talk about like the nature of contact, there are, you know, families where the people speak different languages. So, you know, parents speak two different languages, their children perhaps speak one of them or two of them. And there's a sort of long sustained history of what we would call language contact. So people moving around, trading with each other, living next door yeah. in the same village, or whatever. So like <clears throat> quite often slightly sort of imbalanced power relations. So they tend to learn one of the languages, but like, those people don't also learn the other one. So yeah. you have some people who speak several of those languages, yeah. but not, you know, if you speak the dominant language, you don't learn the other ones as well. And I guess it's kind of worth stressing that, like, the situation is incredibly interesting and there's such diversity in Tanzania, but kind of sustained contact between very diverse languages and long term small community multilingualism is kind of globally, we see it again and again, and it's totally sustainable. Absolutely. And I think sometimes especially if you're kind of an English speaker who grew up in the UK or Australia, you're so used to this kind of stable monolingualism Mm -hmm. with a few people speaking their own languages at home. Um, It's really worth stressing that we're the weird ones. Absolutely. And like, you know, we talk about the linguistic diversity of Africa, but like, yeah, I mean, around the world, yeah, people speak different languages. They shift to other languages when they move, if they need work. Like, you know, there's all sorts of really just practical considerations. You move to a new area, you need to talk to people and feed yourself and, you know, those kind of things. So, yep. yeah. And do you work across all the grammar or are you interested in particular grammatical phenomena? Ah, oh, that's an excellent question. So for the research that I did on Rangi for my PhD, there was a couple of descriptions before. So other people had done... Well, one woman had done a PhD, but two people had done PhDs before, but I essentially did also a description, which meant that I had to know a little bit about everything because I went in not knowing anything. Um, But the particular, I was looking at a particular feature, which is what led me to think it was something to do with language contact, which is a particular word order, which was unusual in Rangi. So um, there is a construction in which you find the verb before the auxiliary. Okay. And it is a language which has the same kind of word order as English, so the subject and the verb and the object. Um, so like the Bantu languages in general, you would expect to say, you know, I eat apples. I was um, also eat, eat is my go-to <laughs> transitive verb. There you go. Um, I, which, I prefer it to hit, which is the one that linguists tend to use. I think I'm just hungrier and less violent. There you go, exactly. So, you know, I eat apples, or for example, I will eat apples, and essentially in Rangi... If you're ever talking about things in the future, so the future tense, um, you say, to eat, I will. And that is cross-linguistically very unusual because Mm. the kind of prediction is that if you have a language with subject-verb-object order, so I 
eat apples or I will eat apples or something yeah. like that, you always expect that will to come before eat. Okay. So in English, but also cross-linguistically, it's a very strong generalisation, very strong pattern, very strong prediction that you will find that order. And in Rangi, it's the other way around, but only in the future tense. Right. So that was my starting point, And because it was in contact with languages with different word orders, really different structures... I thought, oh, well, this is obviously something to do with language contact and how interesting. Um, and I had to do lots of sort of descriptive work yeah. and documentation work to start with. But that was what I started looking at. Um, I think in the PhD, I didn't really end up talking about language contact because <laughs> um, I really got very excited about this auxiliary verb order and the context in which you could have it and couldn't have it. That shows that once you officially got into <laughs> linguistics, you were definitely not reluctant anymore. That's the kind of, when you say, I spent four years getting really excited about auxiliary order... <laughs> It's when you're like... And several years yeah. later, I'm still excited about auxiliaries. Can't, can't you tell? Excellent. <laughs> um, so that was sort of my focus. And then actually I found... So we thought Rangi was one of the very few Bantu languages that had this order. Yeah. Um, and then I found another language that's spoken about 60 kilometres away. So to talk about kind of high levels of linguistic diversity in a small area that also has that order. And I've since found four languages which are spoken up near, near Lake Victoria. So that's now much, much further away. But if you say of that there are... Even if you put sort of estimate at the low end, so 350 Bantu languages, there seem to be six that allow verb auxiliary order. Okay. And so I'm still interested in why, why, why those are, languages yeah. and what, what's different about them. And it still may be that this kind of contact angle plays a role in that. So if you if you speak two languages and they have different word orders and allow different word orders, then that doesn't seem so strange to you to say, uh, to eat I will. Yeah. Right? It, it just because you're perhaps your first language or the other languages you speak allow that, and then yeah. it becomes a natural part of standard sort of way of speaking. Yeah. Uh, so Nepali, which I kind of use for day to day in Nepal, and the the Tibetan languages that I work with, those languages have subject object verb. Mm-hmm. So I apples eat. And now when I learn a new language, even if it's <laughs> ver- a subject verb object like English, I'm like, no, that's weird. My like, yeah. my brain is very comfortable with a you word order that I really struggled yeah. with. Verb final with. is now your, you know. Verb final is great. It's the best. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, imagine that over generations or, you know, your whole community also yeah. speaking Yolmo as well as English and any other languages you learned along the way. Like, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Like the only thing I know about Bantu languages um, and it, it's from the fact, so we worked at SOAS at the same time, so we know each other. Um, one thing that I know about Bantu languages is that they do cool stuff with nouns. Yes. And I do. love nouns. Oh. So can we can we talk about nouns? Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. So they do lots of cool things with nouns, but the most sort of striking thing, I suppose, and the thing that I always give as an example when people say, like, oh, what's unusual or what's the kind of striking thing about the Bantu languages, about Swahili... Um, is that they have a system of what have tr- what are tr- traditionally in linguistics been called noun classes. Okay. So they are like grammatical gender. So if you're familiar with French with masculine and feminine or German masculine and feminine and neuter, yeah. you have two genders, three genders, and Swahili, for example, has 16. Okay, that is, like, I'm not good at math, <laughs> slightly more than three. Yes. Yeah, so... <laughs> So you have, actually, the gender system doesn't make any sex-based distinction, so there's no sort of, like, you know, man and woman or boy and girl, like, grammatically. Um, yep. So the nouns are categorised in other ways. Okay. Um, so one of the, like, really sort of prominent features across the grammar of Bantu languages, actually, is a distinction between things that are alive and that are not alive. So animate and inanimate, mm-hmm. or sometimes, more specifically, human and not human. So let me just use the terminology like noun classes. And yep. then they tend to be numbered because you can't get away with masculine and feminine once you get up to... And in fact, Luganda, so spoke, Bantu language spoken in Uganda, has, I think, 21 noun classes. So okay. like, when you get up to that, you're just like, well, let's just number them because <laughs> we can't, you know, masculine, feminine, neuter, you sort of run out. So you would find, for example, class one would be uh, humans. Yeah. Um, but singular. It's, a, it's very human. It's exactly. We, we think we're the most important. So like humans are like person, you know, the word for person, the word for teacher, the word for child. Yeah. And then what's conventionally then numbered class two is the plural of that. Okay. So teacher and then teachers, child, children, yep. um, farmer, farmers. So you can almost sort of, to start with, think that, well, actually I can cut those in half because most things in the lower numbers have singular and plural counterparts. Yep. That's probably true up until about class 10, because after that you end up with things that don't make a singular plural distinction. But to start okay. with, um, so for example, on the basis of Swahili, you have, yeah, humans. Um, 
class three and four are things like, I don't know, mountain, river, moon. <laughs> so maybe kind of natural phenomena, maybe okay. tree, plant, yeah. things like that. If you're learning this language, these are the things you learn sort of like, okay, well, those are broad categories. And then, of course, you find something that doesn't seem to you, at least, to make yeah. any sense of in that category. But, I mean, people often talk about this with the kind of French, German, gender-based stuff. They're like, you know, well, why are these inanimate objects arbitrarily gendered? And why is like a, like the uterus is masculine in French? Oh, I, don't, I don't speak French. Yeah, it's just my random neither, yeah. like my random <laughs> good go-to example fact of like you know these things are mostly semantically coherent, but actually language is a is a fun system Absolutely. and kind of does all kinds of wacky hacks. Yeah. So yeah. so those are like quite systematic. So you could sort of think, oh, natural phenomena or whatever. And then the next ones are things that often go in pairs or part whole relations, so like fruits and trees and things like that. Okay. So like, but then you get to things that are what we would say like phonologically determined, so they have a particular sound. Okay. So one class is things that begin with ki, and then it's plural is vi. <laughs> so <laughs> we're really we're really scrambling. For so it's like, okay, so yeah. ki vi things and vi things, but again, those things will definitely. Are most commonly inanimate because your human and animal things are going to be in a different class. Yep. So things that begin with ki and vi, um, nouns that begin with nasals, so ng and ng and ng, um, <laughs> go in another class as okay. well. So you, and then you end up with a class which doesn't have a singular plural distinction for like abstract nouns, so happiness, love, freedom, yep. things like that. And then another, I think, a really nice sort of feature of Bantu languages. Many of them have different noun classes for locations. So you have a general location, uh, often a specific location, and an yep. internal location. And those are also different noun classes, like different grammatical genders. You know, okay. Kind of like that. Hmm. So that's like the nouns. But then if you think about how a language works, that then spreads across everything. So my book, you know, the word for my is going to be affected by which class book is in. Right. So in this case, book is one of the ki. Yeah. Examples. So Excellent. It's, it's My kita- favourite category. <laughs> it's kitabu. And then so you say changu. So kitabu changu, book my, literally, so yeah. my book. Whereas if you're talking about your teacher, uh, teacher is human, animate, so it's mwalimu, and then it's mwangu. So not just the noun changes, has a different prefix, yeah. but then the, the thing that agrees, the possessive, the my, also gr- changes. And so it would be the same for numbers, so for counting, any adjectives, big, small, possession, um, of, um, and on verbs. A lot for a new learner to get their head around. Absolutely. But the kids do it completely fine, I'm sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And you can also use it in fun and sort of, uh, you know, the sort of layers so you can put things in different noun classes for pejorative meanings or to change meanings and things. Um, I think you'd like this example. So the word for bird is ndege. So if you think a bird is alive, so you ha- you would make the agreement, the appropriate agreement for class one, let's say, so something that's alive. But an aeroplane is also the same word, ndege, but it's not alive, right? So it- its agreement would be in class nine because it's not alive. So it's the same word. So you can sort of move Fabulous. things around. And so I guess this is how you can create new words. So like when aeroplanes were invented, instead of doing what we did and kind of cobbling together some existing English and French and whatever you can take an existing word and put it in another noun class. Absolutely. So, you know, you can shift things into different classes. They can then mean different things or have sort of subtle different social meanings. Um, and you can cobble together, you know, two words and make a new a new word for something like, I don't know, telescope or something, something that sees far away or, or yeah. things like telescope. But yeah, absolutely. You have a different sort of set of things at your disposal. Fabulous. Mm. And so you were talking about the noun classes mm. for Swahili. Yes. Yeah. And then... Are they similar across all the languages? So that, all, all the languages? Because you've yeah. looked at all 600, <laughs> yeah, obviously. So that's that's a really interesting question. So people have sort of made a distinction between Bantu languages, which have what would be described as a canonical noun class system, okay. which means that they usually have six noun classes or upwards. So Swahili, let's say, it has 16. Luganda at the higher level has 21. And you tend to find similar patterns. So animate things, you know, sometimes a specific class for humans, um, tools, objects, long things, uh, you know, t- trees, things that are sort of yeah. not human but are natural phenomena or alive or whatever. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you end up with languages often in the northwest of the Bantu um, area, so sort of around Cameroon, uh, Gabon, with a really what we would think of as reduced system of noun classes. 
Um, so sometimes many less than six, maybe you know a handful. And the reason that people would describe those as reduced is that the idea is that historically, the Bantu languages, so like the sort of predecessor of Bantu languages or the you know what they all came from, did have this high right. number of noun classes. So that was sort of one of the unifying features yeah. of the Bantu languages. And so the ones that are in Cameroon and that area, which is where the Bantu languages are supposed to have originated then those systems have you know, sort of eroded over time and fallen away. So okay. we would describe that as like a reduced system, not in any sense that it's, you know... We're not peaking. Yeah. <laughs> but that the suggestion is that yeah. at some point they had more and they've lost them. Yeah. And you can sort of see, you know, why you yeah. may lose them. But interestingly, even languages that have lost them, that animate and inanimate distinction is often one of the ones that remains. Okay. So, so it's really strong. important whether something's human or if it's a chair. Like that's a, you know. And languages do this with all kind. Like we see this all the time with different parts of the grammar that languages will have something in this very elaborate system and then it will fall away. Like English used to have this, you know, gendered case marking the way that Absolutely. German does, and we don't have it anymore because the language changed and we moved away from that. So this kind of cycle of things reducing or growing or whatever is is a completely normal part of Absolutely. language. Absolutely, yeah. and it. And it makes it fun to kind of see how languages change yeah. in different yeah. contexts. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that's nice about working on the, sort of the Bantu language family is that lots of... The, so there are written you know, sort of descriptions of some of these languages from, I don't know, over 100 years ago or things, but there's often not long written records, so you don't find examples of writing, um, with the exception actually of Swahili and then maybe um, Kikongo and a, a few other languages, but... We can basically trace a lot of the history of movements of various people in these parts of Africa through looking at the languages. So you can see what languages are you know, sort of similar in terms of similar yeah. vocabulary and, and words, and then reconstruct where these people may have moved from and what time they moved and things like yeah. that. So that's like language really can help us piece together parts of history that we may otherwise... Yeah, they can be a part of the story, basically. Yeah. So Rangi is a smaller language, um, but Swahili is one of the largest languages in Africa? Yeah, so I think in terms of... People say it's one of the most widely spoken languages because of it having this massive sort of geographic coverage across Eastern Africa. Um, I think speaker numbers, really, the estimates vary. So I've heard up to, like, 120 million, okay. which sounds massive. But um, is that in the way that I, like... 60 million? Speak, you know, I speak Italian in that I can navigate an Italian menu. Is that the kind of... Because it's a lingua franca, the kind of quality... Not, not to kind of put a label on yeah, it, but yeah. like the... So, I, I mean, I think probably... I, I don't really know, but, you know, let's say sort of like 60 or 90 million or something. Like, I think actually lots of those people are really very competent speakers who use it regularly for important purposes in their life. Yeah. Um... Tanzania, interestingly, was the only country in Africa that declared an African language its official language at independence. Okay. So rather than a former colonial language. So Tanzania, like, you know, primary education is in Swahili. Yeah. Parliament speaks in Swahili. Okay. You know, radio station things are Swahili. Yeah. But then when you get to those other countries, the sort of official status of Swahili perhaps would be slightly different, or is yeah. different. Um but I think that there are languages which have, in, in like across the African continent, which have much higher numbers of speakers. Yeah. Because, for example, Nigeria, for example, is so sort of yeah populous, or some of those sort of West African areas. So yeah. that you have higher numbers of speakers. So people usually say that Swahili is the most like widespread. Okay. If you can have that's... widespread spoken <laughs> language, that's the sort of like you know that's because it's lingua franca. Status. Positive spirit. Exactly. Kind of exactly. They um, want something. Yeah, so there are cool. people being educated in Swahili and using it for business. Are there many Swahili-speaking linguists in Tanzania or other countries? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a there's a sort of um, not a divide, um, but there are yeah there are people studying Swahili as a as a subject and linguists working on Swahili and other let's say the the main colleagues I have are in East Africa, so other East African languages. So um, I've done lots of work with people at the University of Dar es Salaam. They have yeah. a department of linguistics, foreign languages and linguistics, and then also in Zanzibar, in also in Kenya. So there are universities where people are doing research on Swahili, um, and there's uh, linguistic journals written, you know, in Swahili, published in Swahili. And then the other sort of big cohort of people would be people in. America or Europe who are yeah, learning okay. Swahili. Yeah. Um, in America, quite a lot of them are also of 
African origin, so they're from Africa and may have grown up speaking Swahili, okay. and then have gone to American universities to teach Swahili or do research and things like that. Yeah. But as a whole, um, there is a sort of ongoing range of challenges that people are facing. So lots of colleagues in African universities or in East Africa have real, you know, shortage of sort of funding. So yeah. access to funding for external conferences, to travel, to do research. Um, yeah really high numbers of students so you know, again universities which is great to see so many students interested in these yeah. topics um and wanting to sort of like look at languages and stuff um but obviously yeah you know with in some cases like resource you know sort of limited resources yeah. um and then the other thing that you sort of find is that in many cases people are rather than studying you know swahili perhaps or Bantu languages like from a linguistic perspective yeah People are interested perhaps more in the practical applications. So, like, if you're in Tanzania and there are 120 languages and, yes, primary education is in Swahili, most of those children, when they arrive at school, don't speak Swahili. Yeah. So, like, what what can we do about that? You know, what are the sort of practical implications of that? How can we make transitions more you know, smooth? How can we ensure that people who have or have not been to school have access to you know, services and information and things yeah. like that? So, a more sort of perhaps uh, sort of linguistics and language relating to education relating to sort of access to resources and yeah. stuff like that whereas i think some of the more perhaps like theoretical linguistics and looking at that for its own sake is people are doing that as well but there's yeah. this sort of constant tension between well you know we also have these issues that are right in front of our face and the government wants us to solve them and they say well you're a linguist at the university of dar es salaam you can solve this or do this and yeah. So that's something that you see quite a lot as well in, in sort of departments that I know. Yeah, being super interested in noun classes is, like, great, but it's such a privilege. And, yeah, absolutely, and much more pressing, I imagine people feel that there's much more pressing things that need to be done. Absolutely. And I suppose the there are, it's great, there's more and more sort of students who are also thinking like, oh, well, I speak a language that is not written down, that there's no descriptive grammar on, that no one's written yeah. an article on. Like, I can contribute to that. And so there are like increasingly, yeah, you know, younger sort of linguists coming through and doing that and seeing that that is really important as well, and that's important for you know, identity and self determination and and things like that. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you know, as as actually all of us deal with, you know, well, if you want to get a job, like, you know, how are you going to, yeah. you know, navigate your interest in that into you know, employment or sort of stability or the kind of opportunities that you know um, face you? So. Um, yeah, I, I've been really lucky to be able to work with yeah fantastic colleagues. Um, most of my research is in Tanzania, so those are the ones I have the sort of strongest links with. But going to conferences is always a great opportunity to meet with people from you know, across the continent or based at universities in other countries and things like that. So yeah. yeah, awesome. If you could leave people knowing one thing about linguistics, what would it be? It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be like me and think that languages are the only thing that's interesting, that, that also linguistics is interesting and you can, you know, that's also something that you can, can study. Um, ah, yes. Being monolingual is not the norm in the world. Right. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much it's about linguistics, but yeah, I think we can, as you were saying earlier on, like, think that it's normal just to speak a language and actually globally. Yeah. Um, it's not. Yeah. And I think, you know, there are linguistics departments and there's linguistics training that leaves you with that lesson a lot stronger than other departments and true i feel privileged to have been at a university yeah. that made that very clear to me and it seems like me you have the same experience absolutely as well. yes. absolutely yeah fabulous for more enthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode go to lingthusiasm.com you can listen to us on apple podcasts itunes google play music Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get your IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo, and Gretchen can be found at, at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and her blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. 
Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producers are Emily Greff and A.E. Prevost. And our production assistants are Fabian Anderberg and Celine Yoon. Our music is by The Triangles. We'll leave you with Hannah. Stay Lingthusiastic! Enthusiastic.